everybody, and welcome to Rugby Pass Offload, a new weekly show and podcast with me, Christina Mahan, and a host of other top names, including the man who's actually with me right now, introducing the very shy, retiring, and rarely controversial Dylan Hartley. Dylan, how are you? I am very good. Um, don't know, slightly nervous. First time, uh, I suppose, the pressure's on to deliver something. I've always been a guest, but now I am the host of a podcast. You're the facilitator. I'm the host. Oh, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't really say so that. So the pressure's on to deliver some good good content, I suppose. Now, do, do you know what I love about it? It's um, it's going to keep me in contact with the game. Um, I think COVID's been pretty hard, uh, trying to follow it all, you know, two or three games a week at, at times. But it's kind of like filling the void, you know, having that daily kind of changing room um, kind of banter and connection um, with rugby has kind of completely gone out of my life. So this is going to give me a platform to stay connected with the game I love. So this is what made you want to do this podcast, just to kind of stay, uh, con- stay connected with this, with the whole rugby world, or was it to help with your book promotion? Uh, you were the first to mention it, but genuine, it's uh, filling a void. Um, I do have a lot of time on my hands, so I'm going to use this uh, as a platform to pitch for work uh, and promote my book. And you know what? The, the whole thing behind my book was to give an insight um into the game of the stuff that the people don't see and that's kind of like this podcast for me um i always towed the party line in terms of um media wise when i played the game because i worked and i I played for an organization and those kind of uh views and opinions came before my own so Mm -hmm. i now have a platform where i can communicate my views on the game through my experiences i can form own i form own opinions and i can share those but not to say I'm going to be controversial for the sake of being controversial. I think we've got um, the, the talent that we've got involved on, on the panel is going to give us a pretty broad uh, idea and insight game. So um, I'm genuinely excited um, about working with everyone. So as I mentioned at the start, we've got a stellar cast um, to join you from each of the home nations. So let's bring in another one of Rugby Pass Offloads regulars. A former Munster man, one of Ireland's most exciting players. Welcome, Simon Zebo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Simon, you quick question. <laughs> yes. Well, what do I call you? Because uh, on your screen it says Finn Russell. Uh, <laughs> or do I call you Simon or can I call you Zebes? Well, I must thank Finn for the laptop. Uh, it's a borrowed laptop, but you can call me Zebes. You can call me Zebes. All my friends call me Zebes and know that we're friends. Uh, I suppose that's good. Yeah. Where are you right now? If you've got Finn Russell's computer, are you at Finn Russell's house? Can, can you get him on the pod? <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. He's, he's busy boy now at the moment. I think he's isolating uh, on his own. So we're, uh, yeah, we're under strict uh, instructions to stay uh, in our own places. So he's nowhere to be seen. I've just borrowed his laptop for, uh, for the chat. Um, how's life in France? You literally look like you're living your best life over there. I'm very jealous. Yeah, life life is good over here. Um, it's I suppose it's everything I thought it would be. You know, it's um, and more I suppose. Um, just the complete change in culture, the the whole setup, the the training facilities we have, the the arena we get to play in. You know, everything everything's been a positive so far and. Uh, yeah, we're just really enjoying it. There's a great group of lads, uh, a real international team. So um, everybody gets on really well. There's a good mix between French and, uh, and foreigners. So yeah, we, we, we get on really well and it's Zeebs, much easier. Stop. You're doing media. You're doing media speak. <laughs> I'm just trying to say yeah, your, your talent, Your talent on the podcast, you, yeah. you've got to give us insight. <laughs> but culturally, you talk culturally, is it completely yeah. different? To, to what you're used to? Because you're obviously kind of before that, just a monster man. Mm. What, what's, what's kind of like your key or, or polar opposites that you've kind of um, found in France? Well, it seems like there's a lot more fun in the club in comparison maybe to Munster. I could be wrong, but you do look like you're having a great time. What are you time. saying about Munster? Mm. <laughs> oh, crack. They're hard workers. They're hard workers, but I, I feel like the French kind of embrace that fun of playing rugby as well. No, um, I know what you mean. Yeah, it is. There's definitely uh, more of a shift, I suppose. People are, you know, you're just playing with world-class players. Everybody, mm. everybody is playing at such a high level all the time. It's, it's literally whatever you do to perform on a weekend, you do. And it's, and it's quite relaxed during the week. Although the team sessions would be, would be very tough and, and we'd be on the pitch quite a lot. 
Um, but like, you know, gym sessions and things like that would be a bit more laid back than they would have been at Munster. Um, yeah, you'd have more downtime than you would. It's, 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 it's quite, it's, it, there's a good balance, I suppose, mm-hmm. with, surrounded by so many good players, yeah. I guess you've only got like one answer to this. Um, but in terms of rushing, you, you kind of hear uh, stories or, um, you know, about France being a bit like the Wild West. Yeah. In terms of scheduling, um, you know, some of the stories to come out of Toulon. Um, your experience of rushing, uh, how professional are you guys? Because you're talking a lot about fun, more downtime, enjoying it more. But in terms of professionalism, what is there any differences there? No, it, it, to be fair, not just saying it now, but it is incredibly professional. Um, Stop but, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Bar, I, I, mean, suppose, I, so I had one experience where I thought at the very start with Finn, actually, it was our first day on the job and, and we came in to do a weight session after some tests. And I was expecting, you know, to be really well looked after and, and uh, you know, almost someone to hold your hand through the first session. And um we arrived at 11.40, I'd say, something like this. And, and we had just started our weights and, and lunch was at 12. And the two, uh, the two uh, weights coaches, as soon as 12 o'clock hit, they just looked at their watches and they were like, oh, yeah, uh, lads, it's uh, lunchtime. You're on your own now. So we just kind of looked at each other and were like, oh, my God, is it going to be like this the whole time? But it was, um, that was probably the only taste of, of a little bit of difference, I suppose. We, we played, um, uh, I say we, I can't say it anymore. Now that I'm a, am I a pundit? What am I? And I'm talent on a podcast. <laughs> media. Uh, media. Uh, Northampton played rusting a few years ago at their uh, at your old ground before you had that um your your new facility and that, and the post match was like silver service. I could not believe it. It was like walking into a nightclub, room upon room, um, kind of butlers kind of going around with champagne. Um, the, the buffet was kind of all seafood. It was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And then for the return fixture, like they came to Northampton and it was kind of like curry and chips <laughs> um, under, under the stand. It was ridiculous. But um, do, do you think um, stripping away the international rugby has helped you kind of find enjoyment in the game again? Is, is that anything to do with it? Big time, yeah. Yeah, that was a big factor on, um, on my enjoyment towards it. I wasn't, I just wasn't enjoying it. You know, I wasn't happy, I suppose, going to national camp, meeting, meeting up with, um, you know, I'd kind of stay in my room all day and things, things like that. I was just trying, you know, uh, it wasn't a good place for me mentally going there towards the end. Uh, so um, that definitely pl- plays a big part in, in, in the season. And um, yeah, I suppose I, I'm very, very happy now, you know, so I suppose it all worked out and it was maybe meant to be like that. For me, but yeah, it's probably a little bit sad as well, I suppose. But. No, it, do you know what? It's um, it's something that I'm kind of gutted I never got to do. Uh, I kind of thought if I didn't have to retire through injury, um, there's probably no way I'd still be playing for England because I was, I was actually hanging on there towards the end. Um, but I, I would have loved to have gone back to club and just been a club player because all I've ever known was kind of striving for international honours and the kind of stresses and, and, and pressure and kind of performance targets that kind of came with those sort of aspirations. All I wanted to do was kind of finish at the club, strip it right back, enjoy, enjoy it for what it is. Mm-hmm. And I never got that opportunity. So um, yeah, fair play to you. I'm glad that you kind of found your, your love and you're enjoying it um, with all your money. Uh, ah. drinking red, red wine at lunch. <laughs> and uh, I do love it though, that you're still stealing laptops, even, even at your age. <laughs> And with that cash, you still you still got that thriftiness about you. I know you got to keep it. Yeah, I I, I got to keep that. That's the only thing I have. My buddies from back home make sure I, I don't change. So you mentioned there just a little while ago that you've kind of found your love for rugby again um, through playing with Rossing. Um, and I suppose look with the international set to kick off in a few weeks, I'm sure your situation with Ireland is going to come up again on the show. But you know, say just from an Irish person's perspective, when Ireland play France in Paris at the end of October, like it would be really nice to have a, an inside man um, in the squad. Like, have you been chatting to Andy Farrell at all? Or is this, is this a topic that's kind of a closed, like story, closed book at this stage? No, yeah, I, I, that's a tricky one. I, I haven't actually spoken to, to Andy in, in quite a bit of time now. And um, 
Yeah, I, we have a really, really good relationship anyway, you know, as Dylan would know, he's a quality, quality dude. Uh, mm. or not dude, he's a quality, quality person. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't mind, dude. I'd say he, yeah, I'd yeah, say he, he, would, yeah. he seems like the type of guy who would like to be called a dude. He seems yeah. pretty, hey, pretty hey cool. Hey, Faz, hey, dude, uh, any chance of a call-up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pick me. Um, but no, I, I haven't spoken to him in a long time, so... I suppose the door is never really closed, you know. Yeah. I suppose there, there's no official rule. So if I was to play unbelievably well, play out of my skin, or win a European Cup and, mm-hmm. and, and challenge again next year, you never know what could happen. But um, as of now, yeah, contact has been uh, quite limited, unfortunately. Don't That's worry. Right. Plenty Don't of time. Into it. I'm, yeah. sure he's gonna, I'm sure he'll be listening to the show. So, you know, you never know. We might have just boosted your chances there. We could start a campaign to get... Yeah, um, petition. We could do a petition. Z's back. Yep. Well, I'd imagine he probably will be watching the um, the Heineken Cup uh, final against Exeter. So, you know, how are you feeling going into that? Like, I think you guys are yet to win a big European trophy. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, we have um, yet to win. Uh, it's a huge, huge ambition of the president. We have two big, massive posters, one of the top 14, one of the, the Champions Cup in the training mm-hmm. centre. So we're constantly reminded of it, you know, and and especially of late, the, the deeper we've gotten into the competition, the coaches are, are definitely mentioning it more. And uh, it's all about the first star on the jersey, the first star above the crest. And, and yeah. Um, yeah, there's was, a huge ambition. Was that sold to you, you know, like um, on the move there, mm. the, their aspirations? Was that sold to you in terms of recruitment? No, not really. And, and it, to be honest, it didn't have to be either because I played, I'd say, four or five times prior against Racing, you know, before I des- uh, decided to come over in the Champions Cup and it was, it was tip to tat, you know, they were beating us, we were beating them. So um, you could tell with the squad they were getting as well, how competitive they wanted to be um, and not just compete in the top 14. Europe was always a huge ambition. So um, that, was, that was probably the biggest factor in me choosing a club or being lucky enough to have been offered a contract from Racing. You know, that was a big factor that, they were so ambitious in Europe. Um, yeah. As a spectacle, I cannot wait to to see that. Um, yeah. It, obviously, I'm on the fence about who wins as well. Mm, oh yeah, it's definitely going to be very, very close. Yeah. Um, so, who would you be? Um, sorry, Carol. No, I, I'm just saying I'm confident if we play to the full, you know, if we play to our to the best of our ability. Genuinely, I, I, I don't see anyone beating us, you know, but that, that's a lot of it comes down to us, you know, we have to be on the money in everything we do. And if we are, then we're incredibly hard to beat. Quick question for you then. Mm-hmm. Um, French teams not traveling well. Myth? Definitely uh, not a myth. No, absolutely not. Um, I wouldn't say at our club, and that's not being biased, um, like going to Munster going to all these places, it's, it's to win 100%. And, and if you put in a bad performance, you won't play the following week, like regardless. Um, so it's a very much away games. They all count. Um, mm-hmm. But in the past, that hasn't been the case. You know, being at Munster, playing against clubs coming over, you'd see they'd pick their B team to come and play, you know, and you this is a Champions Cup game. Do you not want to, to win this? you want to not want to play well against the biggest players on the biggest stage? So... I suppose um, it's different at each club, but, uh, but certainly at Racing, it's, it's very much win every single game we play. Uh, before we let you go, Zebo, I'm just going to bring in another big name um, who you'll hear from loads on the offload. Um, so there's 97 international appearances for Wales and the Lions combined. Uh, name a country, and there's a good chance that this legend has probably played in it. Uh, welcome, Jamie Roberts. Hi, guys. How are you? And ladies? How are we? Oh, very well, very well. Train today in the pissing down rain. Are you still playing? Uh, exactly. I knew that was coming. <laughs> you, need, you need to answer this for me. Look, if you were going from Newport to Cape Town, I'd get it. But Cape Town to Newport, you need to talk us through that decision. Yeah. Uh, that's a bit different, mate. I haven't... Do you know what? I think I've only been to Newport twice since being back. I'm living in Cardiff. We train up in um, Ashramanach, which is 20 minutes north of Cardiff. Uh and we, I've actually, we're, uh, first game Friday night, uh, home down Rodney Parade. So, yeah, it's a bit of a different change of scenery, Dylan. Uh, I'll be Jeez, honest you don't you. look too excited about it. 
Mate, Cape Town, man. Jesus. Uh, there's not many cities better than Cape Town. Well, look, we're going to, um, I'm going to get you to talk a bit more about your return to Wales with Dragons in a minute. But the reason why we've actually kept Zebo on the line is because I actually wanted to get a joint story from the two of you about one of the greatest Lions forfeits in history, uh, Simon's in 2013. So I think we've all seen the video. Um, and Jamie, I think you're the one that's actually holding the phone while it all happened. So I suppose, guys, you're just going to have to Tell us the full story, you know, set the scene. Oh, God. Uh, so, you what remember, did you get punished for, mate? It was, yeah. Were you part of the, the committee? I wasn't. I just had a speaker because I had my both speaker seat in the uh, meeting. So, I ended up yeah. just plugging it into that so the lads could hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember some members of the committee coming up to me beforehand, before this big fines meeting. I think it would have been Connor and, and, and Hibbs and um, maybe Rory Best asking me for um, you know a, a recommendation for the, the final dice roll. And I was the one who actually came up with the, the whole concept of calling your coach and, and stuff. And they were like, come on, we need your help to, to get Wady or someone like this, you know, what can we do? And I was like, oh, get him, you know. So obviously the irony of it all, I end up rolling a six for... Um, <laughs> as a punishment which was shocking but um, before that it was um, on the pitch against the Rebels I think and it was um, there was about 79 minutes left or gone on the clock and it was Conor Murray at the time who was at the base of a rock and um, he was real nervous he had his head down muffling trying to get the ball out and I could, uh, I could see him panicking a little bit thinking the game was up and he was looking around for somebody to tell him what to do and I was like, it's up, it's up, kick it out, kick it out. And there was still about 15 seconds left. And, Genius. you know, it's, it's even worse, you know, when, when he kicks it out and he gives it the, the jog, you know, the, the one or two, three paces. <laughs> and, and he looks around and he's like, hey, well, where is everybody else? And he looked straight at me and he wanted to kill me. Oh, my God, I've never seen a man got so angry so quick. And the ref called him back. He was so embarrassed. It was 10 out of 10, to be fair, yeah. yeah and can you just, can you state for those people who potentially have been living under a rock since 2013, what exactly was the punishment? The punishment was to phone your, your head coach at the time, your club coach, and request the captaincy. So, yeah, it was tricky. Thankfully, I had a really sound head coach at the time with Monster and Rob Penny. And, um, yeah, he, he didn't take too much of it. He, he knew it was a bit of crack, I think, in the end, so... Worked out well, but yeah, Connor's still uh, embarrassed by the situation, so it's good. Oh, I'd imagine so. Um, well, look, guys, I can't wait to hear plenty more from you two over the course of the season. Um, I suppose, like, should we try and maybe get the dice game rolling as well? Like, do you think it would work on the podcast? Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Jamie, what do you think? Yeah, we need decent forfeits. I'm sure between the three or four of us, we can rack up some, some decent ideas. I think that sounds good. Well, look, anyway, um, we'll let you get back to your family, Zebo. So thanks a million um, for today. And sure we'll be chatting to you soon. Thanks very much. Pleasure, lads. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Jamie. Uh, I think we have a lot to cover with you, um, but I'm going to start with what made you want to do this podcast. Uh, podcast, I think we are in a Transitional. place now, in all seriousness... Come on. I think yeah, transition. <laughs> no, do you know what? I I think rugby is a really in a really interesting place at the minute with mm -hmm. with COVID and what have you. And I think as players we've a massive responsibility to the game now to to obviously chew the fat with current affairs, but be transparent in what we're with you know, the issues in the game and, and talking about um current affairs in the game, especially to the younger audience. Um because you know, there's a real danger with the game now post COVID that we lose we lose a lot of you know in, enthusiasm in the game and lose a lot of people in the game. Um, and so I think that that's my primary reason for for coming on this podcast is to is to you know alongside fellow international players um, in what is a Lions year coming up this year is to just yeah. join the debate, join the join the momentum behind the game and and yeah. Talk you about current affairs and, and argue amongst the lads, I guess. We're not going to argue. Yeah. Um, but do, do you think it's important as, as a current player um, to obviously voice things? Because I felt when, and I talked about 
this with Christine earlier. Yeah. I think when I played and I played for a team and I worked for an organization, whether it be a club or country, those sorts of views and opinions had to be parked. And I kind of sit here and kick myself now, but you, you had to toe the party line. Um, because I think as a, as a current player, as soon as you put your head above the parapet, people are waiting to shoot you down. And um, without, you know, there's, there's enough podcast listeners to go around, but like the good, the bad, and the rugby with James Haskell, he's quite vocal on this. And I think uh, as, a, as a current player, it's really empowering that you guys do have a voice because it's got to come from within. It's got to come from current players. And uh, I think as long as you, um, you've got a view or an opinion on it's not a controversial standpoint it's not clickbait if it's for the good of the game for, for welfare uh, or for driving numbers to to start playing the game i think players have got to have uh, opinions and views um i just think i don't know what, what do you think as a current player do, do you think it's hard to express your your opinions yeah without a doubt and uh mm. mate you've you've hit the nail on the head when you you talk about uh, when you're in certain environments, you're an employee of that of that business, um, and ultimately, you know you're in in the public sphere, uh, and you have to represent that that business with with what you say in the media, what you speak publicly, um, and you're very very dangerous. Uh, very sorry, very very aware of not towing the line and stepping out of line. Uh, however, I think we're doing a disservice to players if we're not allowing them to be themselves in an environment but i think that being yourself piece is different when the doors are closed and in the change room and in the rugby training environment and being yourself in the public sphere i think they're two very different things so um yeah it's it's a very interesting debate obviously you you reflect now on your career do you don't feel that you you yourself in the public sphere is that what you're trying to say when you were playing for england when you were you know captain of Northampton do you it, feel like you weren't quite yourself or you were saying uh, you were kind of kicking yourself a little bit that you weren't more honest with your opinions was it no I, I fully understood who, who uh, what capacity and role I had um, and I had to park you know there's things with my disciplinary record uh, a lot of it was justified but then some of the processes that I went through to receive um, some of my bands I think were some of them were skewed um, but I didn't voice my sort of, um, I don't know what the word is. I didn't voice just my opinion on those processes. And uh, I didn't challenge because you're obviously challenging the man. And, and when I had a bad track record as it was, um, the, the argument would always fall one way. And I think just when you retire as well, um, you understand a bit more about yourself and the game. Uh, you know, like physically uh, from a welfare point of view, I feel like the game's got a responsibility to look after its players better post rugby. You know, I'm one of those guys now and it's pretty quiet. You know, there's kind of tumbleweeds out there for when you finish. And I'll be really interested um, as a qualified doctor. Congratulations. Oh, God, uh, people kind of ask me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like, what did you do um, on the side of your rugby career, Dylan? I was like, absolutely nothing. Planted some vegetables, um, got a veggie garden. And it's like, Jamie, what did you do? I became a doctor. It's like, it's actually really inspirational that you've kind of done that, but I'll be interested to understand your kind of standpoint on player welfare uh, post rugby, because obviously with a medical background, I'm telling you now, like when you leave, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing. It might be different in Wales, might be different in Ireland and Scotland, but in England, there's nothing. Mm. Especially in an environment yeah. like we have now, you know, in, in, after coronavirus. You know, it's hard for hard for people to pull it now. Look, I I basically I became pro in my third year in uni. Uh, I was with the academy, and so I hadn't broken into the professional rugby scene when I was eighteen, nineteen. So it was a case of right, I'm going to go to uni. I'm still in the academy. I'm playing semi-professional rugby, and and see how it goes because I I didn't have a professional contract. So it was only after I'd done kind of halfway through my second year, starting my third year, I got my first professional contract with, with Cardiff Blues. And, you know, I battled many times with the idea of quitting university, you know, lots of times regularly just thinking, all right, this is too much, this is too much. But I kind of loved the, the challenge of, 
of trying to do both and not failing at both because the biggest fear is that you become average at both and it, you know you don't achieve anything then um but i love that i love that kind of fear i love that uh you know the challenge then to perform on a saturday and then nail some exams towards you know christmas time and then six nations would come round and it'd be like right i've got to deliver then some exams in the summer and what have you um i was stupidly busy and when i reflect on it now i, I definitely couldn't do it again um but I I think this this player welfare piece, um, and I know I know yourself and James spoke about this, and I actually listened to some of the comments and I read some of the comments about it. I think when you accept the career that you go into as a professional rugby player, one of all you accept is going to do harm to your body. There's there's no two ways about that. I think when you're a young guy and you sign up to this life in professional rugby, you have got to understand that. Come 50, 60, maybe even earlier for some people, 34. late 30s, 40s, you are going to be at risk of knee replacements, shoulder replacements, ankle surgery, what have you. That, that's a given. It's an obvious, obvious interstate. If you're playing rugby compared to you know, swinging a few golf clubs on a Saturday as part of your lifestyle, there's a big difference in the toll it's going to take. Um, and my second piece is, is just for rugby players. And you know, again, I've... It's going to happen to me. Uh, I don't know whether it's the end of the season or the, maybe another year. We'll see. Drag it out as long as I can. Um, this piece, and I, I've spoken to loads of past players, and, and Dylan, obviously, you've recently retired. In this piece around their lads struggling and there not being much out there, um, it's, it's probably the most daunting time. But like, I'm scared shitless of it, uh, to be quite frank with you. And I, I, look, I've been lucky that I've worked hard and I've got stuff in you know, in the bank per se, with my degrees and what I can go on and do. But it, I, I am worried. I'm desperately worried. Um, You're a doctor. For, yeah, but even still, I, 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 the biggest challenge comes with not knowing exactly what I want to do. Um, but even still, I think there's this, the first step towards being kind of sane in the afterlife per se of finishing rugby is taking real personal responsibility whilst you're playing um, and I know, again, we talk about welfare and you, you, you mentioned welfare after playing. We have a massive responsibility towards players in the game that they're doing something outside the game. Mm -hmm. I think it makes better people. I think it makes better players. I think we're, we're in a business of producing good people as well as good rugby players. Um, and how many players have you played with, Dil? Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant rugby players. Um, but, you know, couldn't hold a conversation in a room with, with sponsors and corporates, uh, for example. Um, we've a, we've a huge responsibility to do that and make sure people are rounded um, and they have things outside the game. And I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, and that for me, that's the biggest driver to helping people after playing is is doing it whilst they're playing. Um, well, look, Dylan, I suppose look, uh, and, and Jamie, I suppose with everything going on this week, we can't we kind of can't not talk about your positive COVID test been made public. Um, you know, how did it affect you? How are you feeling now? Um, you know, since recovering, have you made any changes to your behavior or towards other people? Um, talk us through it, I suppose. Yeah, I, th I think first off, um, I'm very grateful for the testing procedure because I would not have known otherwise. I was had no symptoms mm -hmm. um, when I when I tested, and look, I, I literally got a hey, I got a phone call from my head of medical on the Friday night. It was like, mate, can you call me? He messaged me saying, mate, can you call me urgently? And I'm thinking, right, why is my head of medical messaging me on Friday night with an urgent call? So I kind of knew as soon as he messaged me what it was. And I'm thinking, right, I'm really lucky here. I've, I've been tested because I didn't have a clue. And that is the problem with this yeah. virus. It's, it's, it's spreading like wildfire and people are asymptomatic and they're carrying it and spreading it. So Look, I'm grateful I got tested. Luckily, no other players tested positive, um, nor did my partner, nor did any members of my, of my family. So, mm. you know, that was the first thing I was grateful for. Uh, I lost my taste and smell a little bit. Uh, we just come back now. Um, has it made me change behaviours? Uh, it probably has. Um, just around kind of handshaking, fist pumping, mm. elbow, you know, just keeping my distance, just being more wary and probably taking it more seriously and that's like anything you know as yeah. soon as it affects you or someone close to you you kind of hits home how uh, how um you know how this virus can affect people yeah can can you give us a little bit of an insight from from um uh a professional rugby clubs testing 
procedures like what 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 you're doing is that what uh worcester are doing what northampton what sale what Leinster are doing is everyone doing the same thing uh i think so i would assume so but that might be different with public health wales public health england and you know healthcare in ireland as well but basically all our meetings are held socially distanced we've got mm-hmm. a big kind of a uh, big tent outside they're not in meeting rooms anymore um you know they're making sure that everything's recorded even gym sessions are filmed um you're coming in you get temperature taken every day and you know basically if they if they identify a positive case they can track through all that footage and identify close contacts who would need mm-hmm. to self-isolate so you know, I think the, the the big question on everyone's lips is at sale how they've managed to get to 19 positive cases before and how getting to four positive cases or eight positive yeah. cases. How they've gone from zero to 19, and that's the that's the big question. Well, how does that happen? Because I know even I think it was announced today that there's a senior player in Munster has now tested positive. So you know, training was cancelled and stuff. That's for one player. How does it get to 19 positive players um, all of a sudden? Like you know, I know Steve Diamond has come out to say he strongly denied the players partied after their their Premiership um, Rugby Cup final win. Like, did they pick it up off a petrol pump as well? Like, how does how do you just get around to that many people in like I just in a professional setup like you said that's tracked everything is tracked now. Oh, God knows. All it takes is for one person, though. You know, that wouldn't surprise me if that's come from from one person who has gone around the squad, you know, being in team huddles, being in the gym, face-to-face with people, um, being in training face-to-face with people. So, you know, that, that's how virulent this thing is. Um, you know, there's also the potential for, for a false negative, Okay. As well, you know, that people may have the virus, but actually test negative. It hasn't maybe reached a threshold on the test. Um, and so they've been, um, you know, they've, they've been kind of offloading the virus and being mm. contagious and not known about it. So I don't know, there's loads of different things, but obviously Steve Diamonds has refuted any claims the lads are out partying after, after the <laughs> final. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's the juicy story, isn't it? It is. Kind of, um, house parties in Manchester and stuff like that, but um, he yeah. strongly, I mean, strongly I, denied I it, doubt the players would do anything that stupid. And I sincerely doubt. Well, even after a cup win. I know it's a cup win, mate, but surely that conversation is had in the change rooms. Like, like, right lads, like have a few drinks tonight, you know, have a few drinks in the change room now, but you know, surely you cannot go out and meet people out, out in pubs and in, university halls or whatever they they have been blamed at doing i i sincerely doubt that but we'll wait for the footage to come out yeah we we, we hope so we hope so yeah. Um, well, look, I suppose we better talk a little bit um, about your move back to dragons that you've joined for a year and um, what were the reasons for moving back to wales uh, so i've always wanted to play back in wales before i retired when i left mm-hmm. i was i was keen to Come back to Wales. I left seven years ago. So, you know, like I've played out in Paris, obviously where Zeebs plays now, out in Racing, um, the three years at the Harlequins, a couple of years at Bath, and then I had a chance to go to Cape Town to play Super Rugby. So I was like, right, I've got to take this opportunity. I'm a, I'm a bit like that. Whenever opportunity arises, I have to take it. I'm a bit weird that way. Um, and then, obviously, COVID struck. At first, I was going to do another year out in Cape Town because obviously that ties in with the Lions uh, playing their next summer. And then the opening yeah. game of that tour is against um, Western Province, against the Stormers in Cape Town there. So that was obviously put on hold with COVID, came back. I was in limbo for about three or four months, um, cycling around London, <laughs> trying to make sense of, of life as most people were in lockdown. And, um, you know, an opp- opportunity came up to play back in Wales. And I, and I grabbed it with both hands. It's, a, you know, it's back in... The Dragons, um, yep. I, you know, I'll be honest, I would have loved to have gone back to playing in Cardiff, uh, where I where I played growing up, um, but the opportunity wasn't there, so, yeah, the, yeah. you know, that chance came up with the Dragons, and it's a club, you know, I started off as a kid supporting Newport, that's uh, where I was born, so, you know, it's uh, it, it's been a great laugh, obviously I had to do 10 days isolating <laughs> the COVID stuff, but we're into the season, uh, we played out in Leinster on the weekend, which... You know, wasn't, wasn't the best great, start to your wasn't season. The best, mm. No, it wasn't the best start for us. Uh, and unfortunately, I got a yellow card, uh, which was fun. 
Uh, but yeah, we, we play at home on Friday night against Zebra, one of the Italian sides. So hopefully get our season back on track. But it's been good fun. Like I'm still playing. I'm still enjoying. Body still feels all right. You know, there are one or two days where I'm going into training. I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm, you know, I'm feeling a bit old now. But usually a few days of uh, rest and recovery, I feel, recovery, I feel all right. Body's um, going to get sore now as, the, as the, the days get shorter and the weather gets colder. Are you prepared for that? Stop putting words into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I am prepared for it. Dulls, how was it for you in your last season, mate? When you look back, what were the little triggers in your head where you're just like, ah, no, nah, this is me? Was it, it injury? No, it was, it was miserable because of injury. Um, okay. I, was, I was saying to Zeebs before, so he, he kind of fell out of love with the game playing at Munster. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it was to that tone uh, that he wasn't enjoying it as much. And then he went to Paris, freed himself up a bit uh, and started enjoying his footy again. Mm. I had a career of always having aspirations to play international rugby. And with all the kind of disciplinary and injuries on the way, I was always battling kind of against the current. Um, so I would have loved to have finished chasing playing for England to just go and play at Northampton and enjoy being a club player yeah. instead of always, um, you know, trying to keep an eye on my body fat, always trying to stay fit, always trying to play a political game in terms of keeping uh, Martin Johnson, Stuart Lancaster, Eddie Jones happy along with Jim Mallander, Chris Boyd, you know, playing that political game of club versus country. I care about them both. But in reality, as a player, you just trying to get through, trying yeah, to look after yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my last season was... Um, you know, if I didn't retire in November, I would have just finished the season this weekend. Um, wow. It, it was kind of hard because I was chasing that dream of the World Cup. Eddie kind of dangled um, a carrot every now and then and then kind of smacked me away with a stick. Um, so I always had hope that I could have one last push. And then I got to a point where the guys were kind of on the plane. and I was like, I ain't making it. And then you're kind of watching the tournament going, do I keep pushing? Will there be an injury? Um, and I was, I was pretty clear that I wasn't going to make it. So during the World Cup, I made peace with retirement. And then during it, I retired. So my last season was pretty miserable, uh, mentally quite stressful. And all I wanted to do was just to play a little bit more, uh, enjoy being a club player. So if, if I had any sort of um, advice for you now, I'd just say just enjoy that sort of... Um, that, that environment, enjoy the game for what it is. Um, because for me, it just turned into to business and um, trying to please people the whole time and, and chase chase that opportunity of, of playing for England again. So um, if it's your last season or you might have one more, I don't know, um, just try and enjoy it for what it is. Well, no, on a, that really positive note, um, we're gonna. <laughs> what? I was giving him some lovely, good. Way to take the tone down. down. Yeah, you just announced his retirement for him. You just took the tone right down. Um, but anyway, I didn't moving on. His retirement. He's <laughs> you. You pretty much just well, you've just guessed it there. Are you he alluded he to it potentially being his last mm -hmm, season, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he it's might be one here. more. But anyway. Last but not least, uh, we have our Sorry, final Jeremy. regular on the show. With 49 Scotland appearances and a decade in the back row for Glasgow Warriors, welcome Ryan Wilson. I got your name right this time. Uh, how are you? Oh, you can hear me and see me. Oh, I can hear you and see you. Yeah, where are you with your halo and your Bermuda background? Just in Glasgow at the moment. I was messing about with it. I've only been sat there for an hour and a half waiting to come in, so I was just... Um, well, I actually don't know how to turn this thing off. I've asked this to everyone else, so I'll ask you as well. Uh, why a podcast? Um, I think a podcast, probably beginning of lockdown, I got some chickens. Um, they're all gone now, got okay. rest of souls. And then I built a house, just almost finished that. So I just thought, might as well keep myself busy with something else. Nice, nice. This is it. Also, you know, looking at the Lions Tour next year, it's probably the only chance I will have of going over there is if we tour it with this pod. So I've like, that already. What a brilliant idea. What a brilliant oh, idea. That we sounds did. like we such a good idea. Yeah. Nice. Jamie, well, I suppose you'd have a bit of local from, knowledge From there, our so. point of view, exactly. we needed a Scotsman on the show. So we did. We, did the, Can we actually got an Englishman. You were the one legitimate Englishman on this pod. No, that's not right. I talk like that usually. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, there we are. Usually I speak like that, but... I just yeah, knock it on and off. What do you, uh, what do you plan on bringing to the table here? Um, 
I've been told that you're a bit of a wind-up merchant on the pitch. Is that what we can expect from you? Well, I suppose you started off with a background in Bermuda, so you've really set the tone. Well, no, it was, it was just IT problems. No, no, no. I'm a, I'm a wind-up merchant on the pitch. Mm-hmm. Well, not off the field. I'll be all right here. Later We're going to talk about Glasgow and the start of this uh, Pro 14 um, season in a moment, but we've actually kept Jamie on because I wanted to talk to you about the plan for the four top South African teams to potentially join uh, the league this season. Jamie, I want you to come from the South African perspective and Ryan, I want you to chat from the existing team's perspective. So like, talk to me about the competition level, the travel, fatigue, family. I'm imagining there's going to be some sort of a isolation period when the players return. You know, I want to hear both objective sides of this argument. Right. So if I am a South African player now, right, I have just been kicked out of super rugby super rugby does not exist anymore in its current format covid has kind of necessitated that the argentinian clubs don't exist mm-hmm. um the one japanese club the sun wolves doesn't exist anymore and obviously new zealand and australia have gone into their their own little league and creating yeah. they've started creating another tournament so if i was a south african club and south african player i'm thinking right how are we going to compete with teams outside South Africa, because we need we need a you know a cross border uh, competition. Um, they could arguably have a competition like the Premiership, so they play everything in South Africa. But I don't think that'll that would benefit them. The country's massive, so you know I don't think you could do that. It's not like England where everything is pretty close. So the best bet is to come to the Pro 14. I am hugely behind it. I think it's brilliant. However, if the if World Rugby are trying to restructure this global season which yeah. they are, uh, with potentially only two test windows being the Six Nations to this extended November period, having a Southern Hemisphere side play in a Northern Hemisphere domestic competition, but then playing in the Rugby Championship is potentially the only thorn in that idea side because it just messes the whole thing up. Yeah. Um, and so as much as the South African teams love the idea of coming and playing in the Pro 14, I certainly love the idea of playing and being on Camps Bay um, and enjoying the, enjoying the weather and rugby down in South Africa, um, whether World Rugby are a fan of that move, I'm not quite sure. I've heard your argument. And now, Ryan, what would you like to add Chuck to this? I want, I want to get to South Africa. I'm <laughs> stuck in Glasgow in the piston and rain. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, I, I, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of it and, and how, how they get around... Uh, the schedule but mm. for us as players you know we we start playing rugby so that you can travel the world as part of it i think um and you know seeing we've, i've seen a lot of the world through rugby and been pretty lucky so putting four more uh, south african teams in there will be awesome because we get to in the pro 14 we get to see quite a bit of the world going you know beautiful places down in wales and <laughs> and uh, and over to ireland but yeah getting to go abroad you know it's difficult for families and a lot of travel but yeah you know, going abroad and um, and doing that stuff with the boys is always brilliant. So, especially when you're getting in your latter years, eh, Jamie? It'd be nice to get away a bit more from the family. Exactly, just... mate. What's your favourite place in Wales? Um, Port Talbot. Oh, Jesus. God help you. What about, like, would every team fly a business as well? <laughs> because oh, you can't crumple, like, some boys in uh, for 11 hours in economy. You know what I mean? I don't think Pro 14 has got the budget of the premiership, mate. I think like Leinster and Munster might be doing that, but is Newport flying uh, business? It's definitely not, pal. We are top and tail in cattle oh, class, I tell you. Dragons on the ferry over there. <laughs> exactly. Glasgow <laughs> on the ferry, mate. Oh, never well, mind COVID. We, never yeah, mind we, COVID. We, Glasgow <laughs> won't be able to feel bloody 19 players due to sunburn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, on that note, Jamie, I think we'll let you go if uh, you're happy with that. Um, well, thank you for joining us for today. And sure, we'll be chatting to you soon. Beautiful. Enjoy, lads. Doctor. Bye, buddy. Thanks, bye. Uh, Ryan. So, Glasgow Warriors didn't have the best start to the Pro 14 season over the weekend. Um, I actually watched that game. I thought you were great. Um, I was rooting oh, for you. Um, you watch rugby? Did... Oh, surprise. I do. Yeah. They were actually playing Connacht. Um, I saw there was a few fans down in the sports ground. How, what was it like playing down in the sports ground? Did you enjoy it? Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't like normal times. You usually get mm. heckled and um, stuff thrown at you down there. So um, I enjoy it more when it's like that. Yeah, there's only 200 fans, I think. Um, how much are you guys missing the fans at the moment? Yeah, missing them massively. Um, you know, I dread to think what the international game is going to be like. You get such a buzz from 
from the fans. Um, even going away to someone like Connor over in Galway at the sports ground, you know, people think it's a disadvantage for us to go over there and have loads of fans, but you still get something from the fans, even if they're not yours. And obviously yeah. we have traveling and support, but it's still just, you know, a buzz around the stadium and it's what you do it for. So, yeah, it's very strange not playing in front of fans. Um, plus the obviously... The other thing, Dylan, is everyone can hear what you're saying. Yeah. So that's I, I imagine for someone, um, uh, I don't want to say gobby. Uh, Colourful. Chatty, like yourself, that must be, um, yeah, you obviously got to keep yourself in a bit more in check, don't you? Yeah, no, I did. Um, but we had Bundy Aki um, commentating mm. the whole of the game for, for the weekend, so... He was he was on good form. Jesus, he had to, terrible. I was going to say, like every, everyone says, like um, you know when you do like Q and As with kids or or even adults, they're like, oh, what's the best and worst place to play? And I'd say the um the best place to play as a player is probably people's perceived worst place. So the the the, the places with the most hostile crowds are the best places to go because it's yeah. that, it creates that atmosphere and it creates that challenge. So I could imagine without any noise. It's just the challenge, like, and we, we were talking about this before. Some teams, some players look flat. Um, mm -hmm. How have you boys kind of addressed that uh, in your changing room? Is it something you talk about? Yeah, no, it's definitely something we speak about. So we spoke about it a lot in training um, in the build-up for the games. It's all about, you know, they talk about celebrating the small wins. Um, you know, Saracens, you hear them constantly going at it. Your old mate Maratoje, um, like, just constant, any any small thing. And uh, it's interesting because not only does it give yourself energy, you know, you're celebrating those small wins, but also, you know, the other team are looking at it and thinking, oh, God, and they're getting one over on us again. And, you know, it's like on a rugby field, you've got to have that constant chat. As soon as starts, things start to go quiet and go flat, it's when the teams start to make mistakes. And, and obviously other teams can now spot that. If, mm. if you can hear them being quiet and, and see them flat and no one chatting, you know you've got the upper hand. And I, I reckon that mental side of the game is massive. Do you see a responsibility in yourself as a chatty man then to be even more vocal? Oh, do you know what? It was weird at the weekend because Bundy Aki actually made me cringe a little bit at how much he was going at it. I even asked a couple of his players, I was like, God, you boys must be struggling with him going at it. And there's a good way to do it and then there's a way which is a bit like, come on, you know, rein it in a bit, pal. What, what about getting physical with players pre-game? Is that a good way to go about it? Well, it seemed to have worked, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Do you know what? I actually need to confess, and it's another plug for my book, but um, I've wrote a nice little uh, sentence about that incident in there. Oh, and, yeah? Uh, I think down the, down the track, we'll have to do a live reading of it. Oh, really? No, it's you not just bad. just do it like a, an almost like a reenaction from both sides. Like what was going through your head? What was going, you know, we oh, could... Geez. I can't remember, but um, we'll, we'll get the book out. It. I've only got a couple of copies lying around, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll um, put it out. Ryan, has, is Bundy always as vocal or is, is it just because there was literally very few people in the crowd that you could really notice it? Like is he, and Dylan, I suppose you've probably played against him um, in, again, when you were in England. So like, is he always such a vocal? I, I love those guys because it's, it's a bit like Ryan and, and I, I've never noticed it with Bundy and I've probably played against him a couple of times. Mm. But I love those guys that are vocal because they're in the game, they're competing. They love it, you know what I mean? They're not just turning up going for the emotions. It means something. Um, yeah. I mean, look, some some pretty horrendous chat gets thrown out there sometimes, but at least those people are invested. And I think as a competitor, you've got to respect that. Um, yeah, I love it. No, that's true. He, he is, yeah, he is like that a lot. He's always chirping, but yeah, it's always a good, you know, a good side of it. You get it with players like Owen Farrell, you know, constantly going at each other, you know, during a game. And, at the end of the game, it, is, it just does become a bit of a laugh. Like, you're like, oh, like, you know, there's only so much you can keep going until... Yeah. With a dead, I, I think the danger now... So you just crack up and you're like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is enough now. Yeah, I think the danger as well is like ref link. Yeah. Like, you, you can't just say things now and, and get away with them. Like, um, everything's played back. Everything's like put out on social media. Um, you know, Nigel Owens puts a few things to bed pretty quickly. But, um, yeah, I think... I don't know if you ever consider uh, if you're an earshot of the ref or not. I mean, I said something once that got me in hell of a lot of trouble. Well, do you not um, remember they started putting mics on players? They did that yeah, there's some... a few years back. They started micing players up and I and they said, well, you, well so you're going to wear a mic this way. I was like, there is no chance on earth you're putting a microphone near me. No way. 
Okay, well, Ryan, we're going to let you go. Um, so I think that's probably enough for this week. Uh, big thanks to Jamie Roberts, Ryan Wilson, Simon Zebo, and of course, Dylan Hartley. And thanks to all of you for listening. Um, more offloading next week. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you can get the podcast as soon as it's released. And feel free to leave us a rating and a review and also check us out on YouTube.